Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you this evening for the opportunity that you have given us to come here and to study your word. And I pray now, Lord, that as we look into your word, that it will guide us, direct us, and that your Holy Spirit will be our great teacher and our great authority. We thank you that we can depend on your Holy Spirit to guide us and to give us strength in the day in which we live. We thank you now, Father, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, as I said, we are looking at Romans chapter 5. And I have entitled this chapter, The Joy of Faith. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, as we've mentioned in other teachings, the word therefore is a hinge that connects us to the ideas of the last chapter and will help us draw a conclusion in this chapter. So the final thought of, of the last chapter, chapter four, was this. Jesus Christ raised from the dead, not, from, not for Abraham's benefit only. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. This is Romans chapter 4, verses 23 through 25 from the New Living Translation. So the opening thought of this chapter is, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserving privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully Look forward to sharing God's glory. Romans 5, 1 through 2 from the New Living Translation. So the conclusion of faith exercised. Now remember, faith is not a noun. It's not an adjective. It doesn't describe something. But faith is a verb. So faith is something that must be exercised. So the conclusion of faith exercised is this, righteousness in God's sight, the peace that comes with the knowledge of eternal life, the undeserved privileges that come with faith in God. I just want to back up one point for just a second and look at the whole idea, the peace that comes with the knowledge of eternal life. Throughout chapters 5 and 6, we are going to be given the understanding by the Apostle Paul that we can have knowledge of eternal life. That we don't have to guess. We don't have to say, I hope so. We don't have to say, I think so. But we can have the knowledge of eternal life. There are many churches today that do not teach the confidence or the knowledge of eternal life. If you were to talk to their pastors, to their Bible teachers, they will say to you, well, we hope so. Folks, I want you to understand tonight that our hope is in the Lord. The Apostle Paul tells us that hope makes us not ashamed. And so we do not have to be ashamed of the gospel, but we can have the knowledge of eternal life. And we can also understand that the privileges that we have that come with faith in God 
are undeserved. I do not deserve these privileges, but I serve the God that desires for me to have these privileges. Now, when I say the God, I am lumping God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in with all of the other gods of the universe. And, and that, that's not improper because God says himself, says, who is like me? Is there another God that is like me? So even God compares himself from time to time with the, with the other gods that men worship. And so when we understand the real God, the true God, the creator of the universe, the one that holds everything together. And we understand that God desires to give us privileges. In fact, the scripture says that he desires that we become, old, we, we are overcome by his blessings. And so they are undeserved. I, I deserve nothing that God gives me but he desires to bless me because I believe in him. And so in that, as we exercise that faith, we have confidence in knowing that in eternity we will share in God's joy and glory. Remembering this, all things belong to God. In eternity, I will be like God. I will have a glorified body. And I will enjoy his glory and I will enjoy his presence, but everything belongs to him. I have created nothing. Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint. In the old King James, it says, now hope doesn't make a shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the apostle knows that in this life, we're going to face problems. Folks, we're going to have big problems. We're going to have little problems. Every one of us is going to face some sort of there's going to be situations in our lives that we are going to face so faith is the tool god will use to help us take the negatives of life and make them productive so tribulation will produce perseverance so the more that i am troubled in this life, the more that it will produce that intensity in me to hang on to God, no matter what takes place. I will have perseverance. I will have tenacity. When I think of the word tenacity, I think of a, a, a dog that has a mushed up face much like a bulldog. Do you know why a bulldog has a face where his jaws are out further? They, they jut out further than his nose. And why is his nose turned up? It's because when he has a hold of his victim, he can still breathe. And he hangs on. And he can still breathe. That's tenacity. So tribulation produces that tenacity, that perseverance that helps me to hold on. And perseverance produces character. Now you see, what the Apostle Paul is telling us is this, is that, that the trials of this life, if we have our faith in God, will come for our purpose. They'll, They'll all work out for our purpose. 
that we don't have to throw in the towel, so to speak. We don't have to give up, but we can hang on to God. And character produces hope, and hope produces achievements. So I hope, my hope is in the Lord, and it produces achievements in my life. I can be like David. David stood before Goliath, and he said, I killed a lion, and I killed a bear, and this day, God has put you in my hand. He could say that with confidence because he'd faced the lion and he'd faced the bear. There are things in your life that you've already faced that has given you hope and confidence in the Lord. And there are going to be things in your life that you're going to face that have been tougher than the things that you have faced so far. And those things are going to build even more sterling character in your life. So the work of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul says that the work of the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God upon us. And he ministers to our hearts. Strong's definition of heart. Now. We want to hold on to this because in a little while we're going to be talking about the old man. And the old man that the Apostle Paul speaks of is a metaphor for the things of the heart. So the heart, as we're using this definition right now, the soul or mind, as it is the fountain and seat of thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections purposes and endeavors it is the will and character of a person so the holy spirit ministers to my will and to my character affecting my thoughts passions desires appetites everything that is me so everything that is me starts on the inside of me my body is going to act according to the things that my soul or my heart thinks. As a man thinks, so is he. So my, my flesh, my body cannot operate independent of my soul. My, there's going to have to be something that is going to trigger the way my body acts. So if my body is going to go toward righteousness, then my heart, my soul, needs to be filled with righteous things. If my body is going to be sinful, then my heart, my soul, is going to be filled with sinful things. So the work of the Holy Spirit are the gifts given to us to use in ministry. Uh, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 uh, through 11. We see that the Holy Spirit bestows upon us gifts. And we begin to act according to the gifts that are bestowed upon us by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 
And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have now received the reconciliation. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So this passage defines the character of God toward his creation. First of all, God loves the weak. I have heard it said that God only loves certain people. But God loves everybody. He loves his entire creation. So God loves the weak. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when I'm weak, then he's made strong. So God is made strong within me when, when I am weak. So arrogant, prideful people don't enter the kingdom. But the humble, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up. Well, you can't lift yourself up over God and have Jesus Christ lifted up. So God loves the weak. He loves the humble. He's looking for a broken heart. So, and God works in seasons. Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 14, to everything there is a season. And God loves the ungodly, 1 John 4, 10. Now, why do I give you these verses? It's because I want you to see that when we were in the state, the condition that we were in, before salvation, God loved us. He loved us before we ever considered loving him. He loved us then. He loves us now. And he will continue to love us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, here are the apostles talking about somebody who might be willing to give himself, to give his life for another. And he said, I imagine that there are some really good people around that might be willing to die for a righteous person. That is somebody that loves God. And it even may be possible to find someone that would die for a good person. Uh, there might be somebody like that around. However, only God would demonstrate his love to mankind by sending his son while his creation was unrighteous. So think about that for a moment. While the creation was unrighteous, it wasn't good at all. God sent his son to demonstrate his love to mankind. I was reading a book last night about faith and why people believe and why people exercise their faith. And this man was using the illustration of talking to an unbeliever. And the unbeliever will say, well, why do you love God? Well, because um, the Bible says, well, how do you know that the Bible is true? Well, I know that the Bible is true uh, because the Bible says it is true. Well, just because the Bible says it's true doesn't mean that it's really true. And the, the conversation went on and on and on. And I'll be very honest with you, I got just a little bit tired of reading that particular dialogue as it went along because there's one thing that's very obvious and that is this to believe you're going to have to exercise some faith that's all there is to it i cannot prove to you that there is god i cannot prove to you the scripture by just arguing 
I prove to you that God is real, and I prove to you the scripture by the life that I lead, by the demonstration of the scripture. That's faith. Faith is active. Faith doesn't just describe something. People might say, well, Dan Cole is a man of faith. Well, what does that mean, that Dan Cole is a man of faith? Well, it means that somebody has watched Dan Cole exercise his faith, and they have seen that God is real. So in my life, I demonstrate that God is real, that God is alive. And to be honest with you, I, I can't argue it away. I just have to live it. This portion of scripture is often referred to as the John 3.16 of Romans. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes, not counting, okay, this person over here, that person over there, or I'm going to take the guys on the black squares and leave all the guys on the right on the red squares to go to hell. That's not how God did it. God demonstrated his love. And then those who believe are the ones to whom that love demonstrated will become activated in their lives much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his faith. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So it's often been said that God loves sinners and hates sin. In fact, I have made this statement many times, and I've learned that this is really contrary to Scripture. It is more appropriate to say that God has compassion upon sinners and he desires to keep them from wrath. He has compassion on his creation. And he wants to keep his creation from wrath. That's consistent with Jude verses 22 and 23. Therefore, God extends his love. Lamentations 3.22 God hates sin, and people that hold on to their sin will perish. Ezekiel 33, 9. Thank God that he has compassion on us. Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Three times, Paul says that we have been reconciled. Now, think of reconciliation as a broken relationship between two friends. A disagreement arises, the two parties separate, there's no communication or accord. One of the parties determines that the relationship has to be mended. The one making this determination was totally innocent, yet he paid a great price to restore the broken relationship. This is what Jesus Christ has done. He paid the great price to reconcile me to God and restore our broken relationship. Jesus Christ was totally innocent. We used to sing a little chorus that goes like this. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song. 
amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, we have received reconciliation. Therefore, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but we have been reconciled unto him. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now remember, this is the definition of original sin. By one man and Adam entered, or by one man, Adam, sin entered the world. First Timothy 2.12, the curse of death came through sin. Genesis 2. 17 and death spread to all men genesis 5 3 therefore all have sinned romans 3 23 so by one man that is adam sin entered the world the curse of death came through sin and death spread to all men genesis 5 3. you see adam was made in the image of god but according to genesis 5 3 after sin all men that were born were born in the image of adam that is original sin therefore all have sin the tiniest baby that comes into this world is born into sin in iniquity david said did my mother conceive me that doesn't mean that our sexuality is sinful what it means is we were born into a world that was that is full of sin for until the law was in the world but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many die, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. For until the law was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law, nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying that sin was in the world before the law. And mankind is born into sin. So sin is not imputed because of the law. The word imputed refers to the legal means by which, uh, by which actions can benefit or hinder a person. In accounting, there is no price or cost associated with the action. 
the accountant understands that this action will eventually cost something. So, for instance, there might be a flood, and a store might be flooded. And how are you going to uh, account for what the flood is going to do? Because it's not just the items that got wet, but it's the downtime, it's the reconstruction. So there are certain things that are going to be costly to you that you have a hard time accounting for. You really don't know. You really don't know how much business is going to be lost. You really don't know how many things are going to be hurt that are eventually going to come back and it's going to cost you something. So sin will eventually cost death. You see, when people sin, they don't think of all of the unaccounted things. They don't think of all the other people who've been hurt. They don't think of uh, the conscious, but the violation of their own conscience um, that has had to take place. They don't count those kinds of costs. They don't, they don't understand that the more you sin, the less your conscience is going to come back to you and speak to you about that sort of thing. And so soon you will lose your conscience. What, what does that cost you when you lose your conscience? So salvation will eventually cost life. So this passage is often misinterpreted to say that before the law, nobody sinned. Oh, we know that's not true. We know that Cain sinned. We know that Lamech sinned. In both cases, these men were held accountable for their sins. At the same time, Enoch was counted as righteous, and the scripture says, and he was not for God, took him. So both our sin and our obedience is going to have actions that there's going to be no price that can be associated. What is the price that you would pay to be taken by God? That, that, that is something that cannot be accounted for, but those are the types of things that will happen. When we walk in faith, there are going to be things that are going to happen in our lives in which God is going to do things, and we're going to look back at it and we're going to say, how did we live? How did that take place? How did that happen? You know, Rita and I had a time in our lives when, when everything was taken away from us, we had all of our regular bills. In fact, we had more bills because we had just purchased a house. And, and, and we look back at that time now and we say, how did we live? Well, we can look at things and we can say, God did this, God did that. But that couldn't be accounted for until we had gone through it. Tribulation creates perseverance. You will never know what you can believe God for if you haven't taken some steps of faith and believed God for something. And remember, God's not going to start with the big things. He's going to start with some baby steps. He's going to begin, because it, it, it would just blow you away if God took you into the midst of some really big things. He's going to come first. And he's going to allow some small things to happen in your life that is going to begin to grow your faith and grow your exercising of faith. And those small things are going to blossom. They're going to bloom. They're going to be energized. And they will become big things in your life. Hang on. God is going to take you for the ride of a lifetime. And folks, you know, we don't have to listen to the news or 
pick up a paper I have right here, a little magazine entitled Understanding the Times. And, and the, the, the lead article is entitled A Preview of Things to Come. The first words are, all of us were heartbroken at the images coming out of Maui in early August. And everybody said it was like the end of the world. We have end of the world scenarios being given to us all the time. For the child of God, God is going to give you the faith to go through it. He's going to give you the faith. He's going to show you the way. I had a young mother send me a picture this week. She had gone to the grocery store and she had three bags. And she said, Pastor Dan, would you pray with us? Those bags represented $75 worth of purchases at the grocery store. She said, I have enough food here to feed my family for breakfast and for dinner, not even three full meals. And it cost her $75. And she was at, she said, would you pray with me? That's what it's going to take, folks. It's going to take that kind of exercising of faith. I, I have told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again tonight. Rita and I were invited to a service in which Mario Morello was speaking. This would have been back in 1998. Rita and I had just moved into this house that we're that we're in tonight. Um, we moved in in July of 1997, so we'd only been in the house about eight months when our world collapsed around us and we had no income. We prayed in everything. A friend of mine had Mario Morello at his church up in Minnetonka. We went up to that Sunday night service. Rita and I were ushered to the front of the church. In those days, we had Rita and I had gas coupons. We would clip coupons. And we would get X number of cents back if we bought some gas. And so I bought some gas on the way up there. It was my last money. I got a nickel back. I had a nickel in my pocket. And this was Sunday night. Friday, we had to make a house payment of $1,200. Mario Morello said, I'm going to challenge you tonight to take whatever you have in your pocket, put it in an envelope, and I want you to direct it to God. Tell God what your need is. And so I wrote on the front of that envelope, house payment. And he says, then I want you to turn it over and on the back. You'll see a place to put your name, your address, and your phone number. And he said, I want you to put your name, your address, and your phone number on that envelope. And I want you to direct that giving to God. I took that nickel out of my pocket, and I put it in an envelope, and I did everything that Brother Morello said. Rita looked at me, and she said, Dan, what are you doing? I said, I'm directing my offering to God. And Rita was embarrassed. She said, don't, don't put in a nickel and put your name on it. And I said, but honey, we have a need. And so right then and there, Rita and I agreed together. We would direct that offering to God. We put a nickel in the offering. By Friday, we had enough money in our checking account to call our bank and make a transaction. To the mortgage company for the full amount and we had money left over for gas and for groceries i'm telling you that you'll not be able to trust god for 150 or 200 dollars if you haven't trusted him for some bigger things first 
start out with those little $100 and $200 transactions and then begin to see what God will do. And I'm here to tell you that my God is going to blow you out of the water. He's going to do things for you that are inconceivable. Rita and I sit back today and we say, how did that happen? We can't tell you. It was like, it was almost like Philip coming out of the water with the Ethiopian eunuch. It was like we were one moment in the water and the next moment we were someplace else. That was the kind of things, God did those kinds of things over and over and over in our lives. So Paul's desire is to open the discussion that two men impacted great numbers of people through their actions. The law cannot be blamed for man's actions. Adam impacted all of mankind by his action of disobedience. Man is born into sin before the law. The action of Jesus Christ in full obedience is to be the way that God will defeat Adam's obedience, fulfilling the law. So Jesus doesn't defeat the law. He fulfills the law. And Jesus Christ in full obedience, the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience. You and I can learn obedience. You and I can learn to walk by faith. And God desires that we be victorious in our faith. Are you ready to be victorious in your faith tonight? Now, I'm not talking about being stupid with our faith, but I'm talking about living life as God puts it before us and being convinced that whatever it is that we have need of, he will make the provision. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man. Jesus Christ abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Note. Note Paul's use of the words free gift when referring to salvation. Salvation is a gift that can only be activated by acceptance. No price can be placed on our salvation. Sin, on the other hand, has a wage. So salvation comes as a huge blessing that overcomes us and overwhelms us. But sin builds up. It's like a wage. It's like you take a little bit of whatever you earn, you put it in a savings account, the savings account builds up. That's the way sin is. Sin builds up. Salvation comes like a flood. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord raises up a banner, a standard against him. So the enemy has to build up, build up, and build up. But God just has the answer. It's just right there. So Adam's decision brought judgment and condemnation. The free gift of Christ 
brings justification. One man brought eternal death. The other man brought eternal life. Romans 5, 18 through 21. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Note the progression of disobedience. Disobedience brings offense. Disobedience brings judgment. And disobedience brings condemnation. That is eternal torment. So even through one man's righteous, one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Justification, just as though I've never sinned. Note the progression of obedience. Free gift, justification, life, eternal life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what have we learned? We've learned that disobedience makes sinners. And we have learned that obedience makes righteous. And we have learned where sin reigns, there is death. Where grace reigns, there is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's thank him for our eternal life. Father, tonight we come to you with hearts, grateful hearts, full of excitement, excitement, because we don't know where you're going to be taking us next. All we know is that you have promised us that we would be victorious in you and that we will have an eternal home. We don't have to guess. We don't have to say, I think so, but we can walk in that confidence. And so I ask tonight, Lord, that as we walk in confidence in you, that there will be a new joy, a new hope, a new expression of great desire. May we have a greater desire than ever before to follow you and to walk in you and to have your spirit manifested in our lives so that the world may know who it is we belong to. And so we thank you. We praise you for this now, oh God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.